Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Kushankar Bhattacharya from uh, Aizar Kolkata Campus Radio. Today, I welcome you all for the first episode of Popular Videos. In the vast diversity of organisms, the small ones always get unnoticed. Today, we will talk about a personality who actually talk about these miniature ones. We celebrate the 125th birth anniversary of Dr. Gopal Chandra Bhattacharya a pioneering naturalist of our country. And to celebrate this occasion, today we will have with us Professor Gautam Basu, a very well-known biophysicist who works at the Bose Institute, Kolkata. He obtained his PhD degree in 1991 from Cornell University. Onwards, he did his postdoctoral work from Kyoto University. And then onwards, he is working in the Bose Institute. Apart from being a scientist, uh, scientific personality, he has been relentless in the efforts to popularize science in the among school students and young people, especially in the rural quarters. His lectures often are in vernacular language and are inspiring, entertaining, and captivating. He is almost like the Pied Piper. Before you know it, you are mesmerized by the science and the science practitioner before you. So. Today's topic is Gopal Chandra Bhattacharya, the maverick scientist. I'm handing over the session to Professor Basu. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, the campus radio team, for uh, in, uh, inviting me. Uh, I would like to use a PowerPoint as I speak. So people who are watching me can look at the PowerPoint. And people who are just listening, they are not watching me. I'll try my best to speak more. Uh, so that even without a picture, you can understand what I'm trying to say. So I'm going to uh, present my screen and just let me know if uh, you, it can be seen. Can it be seen? Yeah. It's all right. right. Yeah. So I am going to talk today about Gopa, a man called Gopal Chandra Bhattacharya. And uh, there are different ways you can call who he is. I would like to say he was the maverick naturalist. And he was not just a naturalist who worked in India, in Bengal mostly. But he also was very special in the sense that he worked with three very well-known scientists all Boses from Kolkata. The first was Jagadish from the Bose. Second was Debendra Mohan Bose. And the third was Shottendra Nath Bose. Before even I talk about this man, I want to show you, I want to read to you a short piece that was written on Gopal Bhattacharya, who, was, who would have been 125 years old on August 1st this year. And this man who wrote this piece was is none other than Professor Raghavendra Gadatkar. Professor Gadatkar is a leader in, uh, in ethology in India. He uh, is at IISC Bangalore. He was a foundation day lecturer at Bose Institute in 2016. And I had a short, short discussion with him about Gopal Chandru. And then he went back and he wrote this back to me upon my request which was really for some uh, little article. So before I, we talk about this man, let us try to see how does Gopal Chandra Bhattacharya, how does Professor Raghavendra Gadatkar summarize this man? And then, then we will try to unfurl who this man was, why he is thought to be who he is, okay? So Professor Gadatkar starts like this. Modern day pundits are convinced that we need money, we need infrastructure, we need laboratories, mentors, role models, and more to nurture young minds to become scientists. But a man named G.C. Bhattacharya defied all these claims to conduct fascinating original research in natural history and published over several papers in national and international peer reviewed journals between 1931 and 1958 getting a fair amount of recognition at home and abroad. It is another matter, and we are to blame, that he has since been all but forgotten by the scientific community. 
there are many scientists, not just Gopal, not just in India, who worked, who they never got the recognition. And it is the responsibility of us to look back, to identify people who, you know, contributed and remember them and, you know, read them, enjoy what they did, continue what they did. And Gopal Chandra Bhattacharya is one of them. The son of a village priest with no possibility of education beyond matriculation, matriculation means class 10, and with a small job as an instrument repairer in Bose Institute, G.C. Bhattacharya used his curiosity, imagination, and tenacity to document the behavior of spiders, butterflies, ants, tadpoles, bats, and more. His researches on worker reproduction in queenless ants and the role of microbiota in metamorphosis of tadpoles are relevant to this day. While modern day scientists are just beginning to study the effect of metamorphosis on microbiome, Bhattacharya was already studying the effect of microbiome on metamorphosis. The nature of natural history and the wealth of unstudied nature in India makes G.C. Bhattacharya eminently worthy of emulation by today's youth. This is extremely important. In India, the nature and amount of natural history that has been remained unexplored <clears throat> is something that must be followed, must be studied. And today's young group, group generation must, must, must focus on this. So for people who read Bangla here, and if you don't know of his writings, you can go to www.bigyan.org. Search for Gopal Chandra Bhattacharya. You will see they have made selected writings of a book called Banglar Kit Patongo in Bengali. Uh, this is just for your uh, information because I think your interest should not begin, a, begin and end with this talk. If you are really interested, you have to explore Gopal, Gopal Da, uh, even though he is more than you know 70 years older than me, but I will call him Gopal Da. You know, he, we have to explore him ourselves individually. And the best way of exploring him is to read what he has written because what he wrote is written in very simple language. Unfortunately, it is only in Bengali. So if you don't know Bengali, you will not be able to access it right now. Now, we're going to start with his childhood, okay? He was born in British India, meaning undivided Bengal in a place called Lonsing. Lonsing is the name of a village. It's in larger Faridpur district. It's on Padda River. So Gopal Chandra was born in 1895. He would have been 125 years, August 1st this year, in Lonsing village, in uh, what is called Shariatpur district of undivided Bengal. <clears throat> now Gopal Chandra's father, Ombika Charun, he was a Brahmin priest. Who they, they had some landed property. His father used to, you know, perform puja in people's houses, make money. Unfortunately, Gopal Chandra's father, Ombika Charan, died when Gopal Chandra was only five and a half years old. So there was Gopal Chandra, five and a half years old. He had three other brothers, a twin and another brother. Okay. His eldest, he was the eldest son. He was followed by three brothers, Nepal Chandra. And two brothers, Pankoj Bihari and Bonkim Bihari, who were twins. Now, what happens when the earning member of a family dies, especially when their children are young? Often what happens is that family takes refuge in some other family. Like his mother could have, and in fact, she was invited to join her brother's family and live with them. But Gopal Chandra's mother was adamant and she said, no, I will not take refuge in my brother's family. We will make it uh, ourselves. So Gopal Chandra, who was about five years old, very soon had to learn the, uh, the nitty gritty details of priesthood. And he started doing puja in families of the clients of his father and make money. So it was a childhood of hardship. A seven-year-old boy takes the responsibility of earning money. And remember, at seven, it's not just earning money. He would go 
perform pujas, come back, and then he would join the local patshala, the local school in the village. That is how he started. So he was working as a priest, making money to support their family, and also he started attending the village patshala. So it was really a childhood of hardship. And I think later on, you will see Gopal Chandra life, even though he, well, he, he did go through a lot of hardship, but even when it was not hardship, he was determined to work with very little. And he could do with very little because probably he started with a very child, you know, a childhood of hardship. So then he went to Lonsing High School. So if you go to on the internet, this is what you see of Lonsing uh, High School in Bangladesh. At that time, it was not a high school. Uh, he finished school, meaning matriculation class 10. He got admitted and he apparently did very well. He did so well that in Foridpur district for matriculation, he stood first. Matriculation in class 10. For class 11 and 12 during those days, you had to go to either a high school or mostly to a college. So he went to north of, much north, well, even north of Dhaka, in a place called uh, Maiman Singh. There is a college, Anandapur College. It is still there, quite well-known college. He went to Anandapur College in Maiman Singh for doing his college degree. That means first class 12 and then the college. He was supported financially by... Uh, there were friends of the family who supported him. Uh, he lived in a hostel there. But tragedy struck as he just as he got promoted to second year, that means in today's time, class 12, World War I broke out. And this effect of the war was prices went up, jobs disappeared, and it was really not possible for him to continue college education with financial support that he was getting from, you know, friends of the family. He had to come back, come back to his own village. And he came back without a college degree. And that is it. He never had a college degree. He never even qualified, you know, finished class 12 exam. Yet what he did work-wise, the language he wrote, the way he conducted himself, uh, you will be uh, mesmerized that uh, how can someone do it? But then you go back and you see there are many people, scientists and non-scientists, who did incredible work in their life without a formal degree. So if you are studying in ISAR Kolkata, sometimes you have to wonder that, you know what, maybe you don't need the degree. I'm not saying leave ISAR Kolkata, okay? But what I'm saying is degrees are great, but degrees are not enough. If not, uh, not all. And you have to become who you are independent of your college education. And that is, uh, um, you know, uh, go, uh, for Gopal Chondo, that was extremely important. Now, he went back to his village. He was 17 or 18 years old. And uh, if you are a 17, 18 year old man during those days, you are under incredible social pressure to get married. And he got married. He got married to somebody called uh, Lavanno Moi, who probably was 12 or 13 at that time. And he had to take up a job. He had to, you know, uh, earn money. So he took up a job as a geography teacher in the local school, not the same school, not the loan skills, loan sing school. There was another school. He started working as a geography teacher. It is not very clear if the teaching job was permanent or it was temporary, but that's how he did. And he worked there for about four years. Now, during this period, he when he was mature enough to, you know, do things on his own, he had a job. He actually encountered nature more than ever this is uh, uh so as a child he did it but more importantly these four years when he was teaching at school he had a group of students who were his followers he always wandered around in the natural surroundings of his village he was curious he asked questions and did everything possible to find answers 
in his own words he writes later and it is extremely important for people who want to do science since childhood i never enjoyed sports except swimming so he was a water baby he was in the ponds he was in swampy areas you know he was in the river in my spare time i would walk around in the wilderness watching insects birds fish aquatic creatures in rivers and swampy forests i used to keenly observe plants too i may not have understood then the relevance of what i watched but i think those observations laid the foundations of the work i did later in life so what is the time frame the time frame is 1915 1916 1917 1918 i just wanted to re remind you that 1915 jagadish chandra bose retired from presidency college he was 58 years old 1917 jagadish chandra bose established bose institute in kolkata and really there were two other science institutes before bose institute in late 1800 indian association for the cultivation of science was established by mohanlal sarkar and father lafon it was but as the name suggested it was you know indian association for the cultivation of science so instead of science at the beginning it, science was being cultivated that means only a series of lectures were given to the common people so they get primed for what science is and then in 1909 indian institute of science was established in bangalore but indian institute of science remember was still not a it was still controlled by the britishers it was still a colonial institute it was not an indian institute 1917 bose institute was set up by jc bose it was an institute set up by an indian for indians and by indians you know it was a purely indian endeavor so that was the time 1917 and at 1917 this man gopal chandra is teaching in high school as a geography teacher and hanging out with nature he was a curious young man i mean there are many little things here and there he wrote he said in interviews but here is a little piece where he talks about you know when he was in class 8 student he started dismantling a table clock he did this he did that he looked inside he saw the balanced wheel was moving very fast but nothing else was moving he poked something the spring fell out then he put the things back and that is how he learned and that is really how science should be learned we must play we must break things apart you know you get a florimeter in your lab uh, if your teacher is not there just dismantle the whole thing and put it back that is how he learned about watches clocks gramophones and other instruments there was a teacher called jogen master that he mentions a lot so jogen master used to teach them by whatever i don't know what subject i forget but he was more like was to really inspired them one day this man brought some seeds shiny clean seeds of some unknown fruit and then he kept these seeds on the table and these seeds started jumping and then what jogen master did is like a bad magician he showed them the origin of the magic and the origin of the magic was that inside the seeds there was some kind of a larva and these larvas were squeezing inside the seeds and as they squeezed the seeds jumped these little things these interactions made him more and more interested about nature he had he used to play with kids there was a kid called shuren who was his friend shuren didn't go to school shuren worked with the jute the jute as jute uh, was grown then it it uh, was well, they were allowed to rot in the water then you bring out the jute so he never went to school but he was a good friend of uh, uh, gopal chandra and it was people like shuren who showed gopal chandra insect behavior he would take gopal chandra one day and show that um, you know uh, two ants on top of each other but very close inspection they found out they were not ants they were spiders pretending to be ants and so there are many other things and one place he writes that you know my friend shuren he died young he could have become much more famous like salim ali again salim ali is another person that uh, one can talk about these are incredible people what they did in a very non formal way they did science 
let me talk about a paper, not a paper, it's an article that he wrote and published in a Bengali uh, uh, journal called Probashi in 1919. Very roughly translated, the title of the article is The Extraordinary Power of Rotting Plants to Emit Light. What he did was there was an area called Pachir Mar Bhita. It was an abandoned kind of house with garden. And there was, you know, a lot of stories about ghosts there. And people used to see light in the, at night there emitting from God knows where. But he went in. He went in fearless. And he found out that actually there were little wet wood that would glow. So he would bring those wet wood in the dark in his house. It glowed all night. In the morning, it wouldn't glow. When it dried up, the glow went away. He, he put water on the wood, it started glowing again. If you read the article, he describes this. And he says, I don't quite understand why this is happening. Can someone tell me? And you know, now we know that this is because of bioluminescent fungi that was, you know, breaking down the wood. So Panchir Mar Bhita is a very, if you are a Bengali man, you know, you know, this is so... Rural, you know, there is a somebody called Panchi. Her mother has a used to live in a place. No one lives there anymore. It's kind of overgrown, and any place that is overgrown with nature has incredible uh, biodiversity. And what he did was, did not he was not afraid. He was amazed. He would go in. He would actually write down things, document them. But remember, Prabhashi Potrika was not a scientific journal. Okay. But he wrote it. He published the paper. Fine. Then, during this time, he went to Calcutta. He went to Calcutta for some family business. But remember, he did not like his job as the geography teacher. So he was looking for a job. He was looking for a job. And what happened was he got he landed up in his second job. His second his second job was a job of a telephone operator. Uh, he uh, he got a job as a telephone operator in 1919, and this was a job at Bengal Chambers of Commerce. They had a branch in Kashipur beside the river, and he started working. But he did not like that work either because they had to speak a lot of English. He didn't quite understand English. Also, not just English, how the colonials worked with the locals. There were a lot of cultural things. So he was looking for a job. And then it so happened that there was a chance meeting of him with J.C. Bose during that time. Remember, I showed you that article. I, I talked about this article on bioluminescent plants that he published in Prabashi. Jagadish the Bose, after he started Bose Institute, he was looking for young people. Probably he was looking for people who are very curious, very competent but who would be willing to work as his assistant. He saw this article called Luminescence by Rotting Plants by Gopal Chandra. One day he was discussing this article with the editor of the magazine called uh, Ramananda Chattopadha in his house. It is then that another man called Pulin Bihari Dash now, Pulin Bihari Dash is a very well-known revolutionary freedom fighter who established Dhaka Unushilan Shomiti. Pulin Bihari Dash came to Jagadish Chandra Bose. He, he was just released from the jail and because he was seeking some advice from Jagadish Chandra Bose. Now, Pulin Bihari knew Gopal Chandra because both Gopal Chandra and Pulin Bihari came from the same village, Lone Singh, in today's Bangladesh. Now, when Bose was discussing this article with Ramananda Chattopadhyay, Pulin Bihari said, well, you know what? I know Gopal Chandra, the writer that you are discussing. I will go and ask him to come and meet you. So that was great. And Pulin Bihari went back to Kashipur and he uh, told Gopal Chandra that Jagadish Chandra Bose wants to meet you. Uh, Gopal Chandra was uh, flabbergasted, but he did go. The next day, 
And uh, at, at that time, I told you it was 1921, Jagadish Chandra Bose established Bose Institute. He was looking for actively young people. So this is what uh, um, uh, Gopal Chandra writes about his meeting with uh, Jagadish Chandra Bose. And the next day, I met Jagadish Chandra. I was afraid. After asking about what I do and where I live, he wanted to know my experience about light emitting plants. I told him my experience to which he said that the phenomenon is complex and that even the Western world has not been able to decipher it. It will be very tough for me to carry on further research in the topic. Instead, if you join Bose Institute, you would learn a lot, he continued. I was elated. I was elated with the offer since that was my secret wish. I knew about Jagadish Bose. I knew about his work. I agreed. And I started my long career at Bose Institute. So he joined the same year, 1921. He was 26 years old. And he worked at Bose Institute until 1971. He was 76 years old. I just want to point one thing here. Today, we have many national institutes. There are many directors. There is no way a director can hire a person just because he thinks that this guy is cool. This guy is smart without any formal training. So these were advantages during those times that the freedom of running an institute and ultimately, you know, if you want to do creative work, it cannot be through very formal training. There has to be also uh, non-formal people coming in. It has to be both. And I think such, uh, uh, you know, I mean, it was possible for Rabindranath Tagore uh, Jagadish Chandra Bose, when they ran Rabindra, uh, Vishwa Bharati, Vishwa, um, Vishwa Bharati or Bose Institute during that time to hire people as they felt correct, which unfortunately is not so easy uh, today. Uh, early work at Bose Institute. He started working at Bose Institute. Now, what will he do? Of course, he became an assistant to Jagadish Chandra Bose. What did he do? His main job was to drawing pictures of newly devised instruments. Now, uh, Jagadish Chondo actually sent him to the Kolkata Art School for a few months to get training in perspective drawing so that he could do drawing better. Photography. Photography was something very important during those days. And his responsibility was to not only take pictures, and we will see later how incredible he was as a photographer, but also develop them. He would work in the workshop. Bose Institute was very unique because I think from the very beginning, they had a workshop where people would use uh, things. And uh, Gopal Chandra apparently told Jagadish Chandra Bose that I need a microscope and I need access to the lathe machine. That's it. I'll do what I want to do. By the way, Jagadish Chandra also made Gopal Chandra take a course in uh, a, for, for a course for electricians. So then he could also work with things that needed uh, electrical connections and electrical circuits. Another interesting thing happened during that time that the famous biologist Hans Mollisch, Hans Mollisch was a uh, Austrian German biologist who is very well known for his work in bio luminescence, also uh, 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 um, photosynthesis. He spent six months at Bose Institute in uh, uh, 1928, Gopal Chandra worked as his assistant. So Gopal Chandra took him all over for collection of plants. In fact, they did work with bioluminescence and apparently they did isolate the, uh, the fungi that was responsible for bioluminescence in the kind of bioluminescence that he saw. But uh, there are no papers that they published. So it is not very clear what happened to their research. Anyway. In some sense, therefore, this time, the first five, six, seven years that Gopal Chandra spent in Bose Institute, he did not do quote unquote science, but he was getting trained in formal science, how to do science, how to, you know, organize yourself, how to make instruments, how to de design experiments. In some ways, it was a kind of a informal formal training as he worked in Bose Institute for first couple of years, I think five to seven years. Then he started working with plants. He started working with plants because Jagadish Chondo was interested in plants at that time. 
and uh, he worked with Maimosa Pudika, an important plant that Jagadish Chandra and his uh, group worked. Jagadish Chandra Bose had a hypothesis about how uh, perturbations to the pulvinus, the, which is a joint-like thickening at the base of a plant that makes the leaves go down or go up. So he started working on the electric current effect of the electric current. But most exciting for him was he was working on a plant called, uh, he was, you know, he was into this uh, uh, microscope. Microscope was something extremely important then. So he worked with Kolmisha, called the water spinach. He made sections. What he saw to his surprise, at, after make, uh, cutting sections of the stem, completely new types of cells started to grow. He showed, he saw it under the microscope. He was excited. He ran to J.C. Bose. He showed him his data. J.C. Bose asked him to write a paper for Bose Institute transactions. That was a journal that Bose Institute was publishing and majority of papers, scientific papers, including J.C. Bose's from Bose Institute was being published there. He wrote the paper, showed it to J.C. Bose, but J.C. Bose was not very happy with the way the paper was written and he did not approve. That really made him very depressed. That this disappointed uh, uh, Gopal Chandru. And he decided not to focus so much on plants because he realized that if he worked on plants and if he wanted to publish anything, Jagadish Chandra Bose will be in control. And as an independent researcher, he was slowly feeling, you know, that he does not really want to work with Jagadish. Jagadish let Jagadish be there, but he wants to be free. So what he did was he started his work with insects again. That is where his heart was. He restarted working on insects. You know, he worked with many different things. <coughs> then what happened in late 1920s, Jagadish Chandra Bose died in 1937. So this is about seven, eight years before he died. Jagadish Chandra changed policy. He felt he was not doing very well physically. And he said that, Everyone need not be his assistant. People can start publishing their independent papers. And he allowed and encouraged Jagadish, uh, Gopal Chandra to publish his own work, single author papers. So he started working on spiders, on ants, on tadpoles, on caterpillar, butterflies. He worked with bats, uh, you know, you name it. Between 1931 and 1941, Gopal Chandra published about 16 research papers in Bose Institute Transaction, Bombay Journal of Natural History, uh, of Society, Science and Culture, uh, Current Science, American Scientific Monthly, Natural History Magazine. But there were not many. His main, I mean, altogether, he published 22 papers in his life, okay, uh, in English, uh, and uh, not necessarily peer-reviewed journals like today. So here, the first 11, it starts with uh, 1931 in a uh, Bose Institute transaction, 1937, Bombay Natural History Society, 1937, again, Bose Institute transaction, and the last one is 1958 in science and culture. More than his English papers, he wrote vociferously in Bangla, in Bengali, in Probashi, that magazine where he published between 1933 and 1944, he wrote about 30 articles. And they were all, many of them were original articles. We'll talk about some. One is called Kude uh, Pipre uh, uh, Blitzkrieg. That means Blitzkrieg by tiny ants. And I will explain what Blitzkrieg is later on if you don't know. There is one article called Kan Kotari Jibun Kotha. Kan Kotari is an, instru uh, is an insect in Bangla, in English called Yearwig, and we'll talk about that. Okay? There is Kumore Pokar Shantal Rukhal Koushal. So how does this insect protect their kids? So these are incredible animal behavior, insect behavior, painstakingly observed over months, months, and uh, incredibly described. So we will just talk about few from here as an example. Again, this is not to talk about his science. This is just to give you a flavor. 
Khan Kotari Jibon Katha that he published in Probashi in 1944 are uh, the insects are called your wings. What is the big deal? The big deal is that what he found out is that these insects, your wigs, when they when the mother lays eggs, they deliberately dip their hind legs in mud, dry those, they become like solid, you know, weapons. And anybody who approaches them, they start kicking with those mud boots. What he did is he added water to those mud boots and dissolved the solid. The insect would go back again deep her hind legs in mud. That means it is deliberate. It is deliberate. Every time you get rid of the mud, he will go and go and dip her hind legs, dry them and get ready. Interestingly, the same mother, when not laying eggs, would have no interest in digging her hind legs in mud. So Ratunlal Brahmachari, uh, another uh, ethologist, we'll mention him later on, was the first to highlight such uh, you know, work done by uh, Gopal Chandra, which he thought was incredible at that time, the kind of, you know, so who, who is capable of using a tool? To use of tool was something that was debated at that time. Can non-humans do it? Can primates do it? Can other animals do it? Things like that. Again, I'm not an expert in this. I don't want to go in. All I want to say is that this is the main point. He also, for example, showed, he wrote in one, uh, uh, one, one article, how he saw cockroaches getting stuck in glue. He saw cockroaches getting stuck in glue. Then he saw ants coming, trying to grab the cockroaches' meat. But they, are also, they also got stuck in glue. Once several got stuck in glue, then what happened was he saw ants would bring tiny sand pieces and place them on the glue one by one, one by one, and actually make a bridge of those sand and then walk on the bridge. So these are incredible behavior doc being documented by a man who uh, had no reason to do it. He, he did not have any reason to document such in such details behavior and these were incredible observations today we know about <clears throat> a lot of video games about war or ant war and there is a word called blitzkrieg it's a term used to describe a method of offensive warfare designed to strike a swift focus blow at enemy it's a warfare tactic so during <clears throat> so what what Gopal Chandra described, and this was, it's a very similar time, similar things were being described in the West. And Gopal Chandra's ideas were completely ignored, partly because he wrote in Bengali, partly because of the war, whatever it is, partly because of discrimination. I don't want to get into that. But what he did is he described this war between uh, two kinds of ants that warfare went on for three, four days. And he watched and watched and watched and wrote down exactly the strategy, what happened, who, then what happened, this, what happened. And then the entire story tells you about their social behavior. It brings out something that probably we all know. We all in, living in India in a warm place. We all see ants moving, fighting. But to actually observe in a, and, and write down the organization was incredible. And incredible work that he did during this time was sex caste determination of ants. And I just want to say that this is the time when Jagadish Chandra died and another man became uh, our uh, director of Bose Institute, Devendra Mohan Bose. We'll talk, uh, talk about him a little bit. But this kind of work was done also during Devendra uh, Mohan Bose's time. What he did was he worked with some arboreal, you know, tree uh, 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 ants that live in trees. How do you, how do you, how do you follow them? How do you study them? So he built and designed an incredible cellophane ant nest in Bose Institute where he somehow was able to allow these ants to have a nest. So it was a transparent cellophane nest and he could observe everything. The things that he was asking himself is what is it that makes the uh, the the you know the workers, uh, sex and the female and the male and the queen. 
and there was a lot of debate at that time uh, external versus internal factors like uh, you know in honeybees uh, there is uh, the uh, royal jelly and so it there was uh, a um, um, right uh, right then uh, there uh, people thought that vitamins like especially e and b1 they play a role he worked with them you know giving them uh, control and experimental groups vitamin e vitamin b1 but ultimately what he found was that they were necessary but not sufficient but anyway what he basically showed was sex determination was convincingly due it was an external factor it is not an internal factor and uh, another thing that he did was he showed that uh, these uh, uh, the ants during uh, spring uh, they go and get some aphids and they suck the juice of the aphids and probably the juice of the aphids plays a very important role he could not finally uh, you know come to a conclusion but now we know that at least for uh, 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 in 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 uh, royal jelly which plays a role in queen bees it is epigenetic that plays a role so ultimately some external factor comes in that plays a role in changing the internal factor so in royal jelly we now know that there is a protein called royal actin and what this royal actin protein does it interferes with changing the dna dna methylation if you don't know what is dna methylation it doesn't matter it's changing the dna so that you know, uh, 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 it changes whether the ant becomes a queen or a, a worker or a male or a female. Anyway, the details are not so important, but this work was a very important and key work done by Gopal Bhattacharya. I will quickly uh, show some pictures here uh, because photography was extremely important for as far as he was concerned. This is a, if you are uh, people who are seeing this, this is a uh, 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 article that he published in 1936 called Diving Spiders. It was published in Natural History. I'm going to read the first paragraph just to show you the kind of English, that kind of flow that he wrote. Then I'm going to read the main headings of the three page uh, article. It's called Diving Spiders. Familiar with the rapid manner in which spiders move on land and with their web spinning maneuvers in the air, many people do not realize that certain varieties have also attained astonishing mystery in the realm of water. To see them leap here and there on the surface of a river or lake is in itself a surprising sight. But most fascinating of all, perhaps, is their habit of submerging and remaining under water for considerable periods. He showed that these spiders could remain underwater for 20 minutes at a stretch. A spider of this sort is Lycosa anandalai, whose activities it has be been my fortune to observe in the neighborhoods of Kolkata. He was in Domdom, close to the airport, and that is what he did. Rest of the paper, the, head, uh, the head, subheadings are searching for stick spider. Next, a chase. Next, courtship. Next, female larger next tenacious instinct next fish hunter that is how he breaks it so this is a scientific paper but it is written so lucidly anyone can read and really enjoy it and all his bengali writings are like this now this picture paper came with photographs we remember these photographs were published in 1936 we did not, he did not have a you know, cell phone camera that he would just click. A camera was not a very easy thing during those days. And to take such close up pictures. I want to show you some pictures, people who are seeing this. This is a picture of uh, the, the spider itself, two of them, what, what underwater uh, uh, on, the, on the top. This is an incredible picture. On the left, you see a big leaf on the water. On the leaf is a spider holding a fish. I have actually uh, a, a magnified it here. If you still don't understand, I asked my, I asked someone to do a sketch of this uh, so that you can see. So what you see here is actually a spider that actually dived, caught a fish, brought the fish up on the leaf and is devouring it. This is, these photographs are incredible. 
uh, here is the another spider what it is doing if you can see it very well part of it it is holding a leaf that is floating and it is actually surveying the water surface holding the leaf leaf and you know just gliding over water here is a spider uh, mating here is a male spider and a female spider and what uh, Gopal Chondo uh, uh, describes how the female would go and uh, mate and then actually eat the male. He did capture these spiders in Bose Institute. He started following them in a controlled environment. He took the female uh, who uh, got, uh, you know, and then uh, in captivity after 15 days, it laid eggs and it goes on and on. So, you know, this is not something that you will learn from this talk. But I will, anybody interested, I'll show you. This is internet, available on the internet. You can see these incredible photographs and appreciate how this guy is taking, has taken such incredible pictures. Not here. There are also pictures of, uh, uh, there's a picture of a uh, spider, of a lizard getting stuck in a spider uh, net. The spider is waiting on one corner and how it slowly goes, captures it. There are spiders that, so he really worked on a lot, many different things, but spiders were one of his main specialty. Now, one thing happened was, I, we talked about uh, DM Bose. I don't know if you, uh, not, some of you know about Devendra Mohan Bose. Devendra Mohan Bose was a Palit professor in Calcutta University. He was the nephew of Jagadish Chandra Bose. After Jagadish Chandra Bose died, DM Bose was given, was he was, became the director of Bose Institute. He is named to fame, among other things, is that uh, uh, if you are from Bengal, then you may have heard of Sandakfu. You may have gone there trekking up at 13,000 feet. But uh, Bibha Chaudhuri, DM Bose student, and DM Bose, they used to go up to Sandakfu in 1930s to put up detectors to detect uh, you know, particles that will come from space. Basically, they were looking for mesons, and they did discover mesons uh, from photographic plates, but they could not do it very well, well enough to, uh, to have no doubt at all about the meson tracks. So ultimately, they did miss the Nobel Prize. A uh, person who got the Nobel Prize clearly stated how they, he used you know, methods used by DM Bose. DM Bose did many other things, but all I'm trying to say is that his work on mesons uh, is uh, something extraordinary, he and Bibha Choudhury. So when DM Bose became the director of Bose Institute, he brought many structural changes in it, like new departments, hiring people, but he also continued the research work of JC Bose. He, he had great respect for scientists who worked with JC Bose, including Gopal Chandra. At that time, 1930s, you know, antibiotics were the in thing. You know, everybody thought antibiotics, that's it. Uh, and uh, DM Bose learned that in America, farm animals were being fed antibiotics and they became big. So he told Gopal Chandra, I read somewhere that in the US, US, farm animals who are fed food containing penicillin or streptomycin are growing fast and big in size. Why don't you try something similar on your ants and observe if there is any such effect? So Gopal Chandra started to feed antibiotics on his ants, to his ants. It was not easy. But what happened was strange things happened. Sometimes these ants would become much smaller in size. Sometimes this will happen. But they were not becoming big as was expected when uh, antibiotics were spread, uh, e uh, given to farm animals. Actually, he discovered something very incredible he discovered how probably bacteria plays a role in ant development because these antibiotics were going and destroying the bacteria. But he, he ignored his results. He was very uh, disappointed and he didn't know what to do. So what he did was, by chance, the same laboratory where he was working with ants, he had collected some tadpoles. And he started giving these antibiotics to tadpoles. And you, we all know tadpoles have a very clear cycle. It, you know, a tadpole will metamorphosize into a frog. 
what happened was, and that was incredible, that as he gave penicillin and uh, streptomycin to tadpoles, the metamorphosis was delayed. Sometimes metamorphosis never happened. Many died. What he did was, when he gave vitamin B12 to these penicillin-treated tadpoles, it triggered full metamorphosis into froglets. And what was most incredible is that, I, again, not going into the details, this was about three, four years' work published in uh, Science and Culture, without going into the details. All I wanted to say was, his conclusion was, you know, he did dissect the frogs. He did find out what these uh, 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 um, um, antibiotics were doing. They were actually destroying the microbes in the gut. So in some ways, this was gut microbiome. You know, this is what we are interested in now. We now know that the microbiome in our gut can dictate many things. And what he did then was he concluded he actually did that. So Gopal Chandra very correctly guessed the effects of microbiota on development much ahead of times when practically nothing was known about them. So this was serendipitous, but this was incredible. And uh, this is not a very simple experiment. Remember, this is uh, 1954. So he was already 60 years old. And then uh, at that time, I just want to say people thought penicillin was the elixir of life. If you have penicillin, you're not going to grow old. Because, Bangla, because the tadpoles never metamorphosized. So if you know Bangla, you will see that during that time, a lot of writing, popular writing was going on. In fact, Gopal Chandra himself wrote an article called Sthir Jobon Ba Punor Jobon Shambhav Kina. You know, can you uh, get back uh, youth? Can you hold youth? Can you, you know, uh, get, uh, get... So because people didn't quite understand what was going on with this penicillin. I just wanted to tell you something about uh, another aspect of Gopal Chandra. He participated in armed resistance against the British rule in his own way. I told you that Pulin Bihari Dash, he was the revolutionary leader who he and Gopal Chandra were born in the same village. Uh, and so therefore, through him, Gopal Chandra was involved and knew what was going on by people who were participating in armed revolution, okay, against the British. What we know is, there's a book called Biplover Shandhane, that means In Search of Revolution. It is written by another revolutionary freedom fighter called Narayan Bandopadhyay. I will read out part of from his book, which will tell us the involvement of Gopal Bhattacharya while he was at Bose Institute, helping secretly people who were fighting the British. He writes, I went to Gopal Bhattacharya at Bose Institute and requested that he teach me how to make bombs. Are you crazy? Kick on, he said at first, but introduced me to Shotish Babu, from whom I learned to use nitroglycerin and nitrochlorine. This is probably nitro, tri, nitro trichloride. And the precautions and the precautions during their use. When I told Gopal Babu, he said, Why stop there? I will introduce you to someone who will teach you how to use something much more powerful, TNT. This is how I obtained the details of making TNT. There was another time when after the Chattogram attack by Mashtadda, there was communication loss between uh, Chattogram and Fort William, but they were using wireless to communicate. And there was this uh, uh, idea of jamming the wireless at Fort William that was used by the British. So apparently Gopal Chandra at that time was ready to go to Fort William to check out their wireless power system with the intention of jamming it. He was a social worker when he was young in village. He started a group called Komon Kutir where the underprivileged children could stay and take tuitions without paying any money. It was also a self-help group teaching skills to women and girls. He was a Brahmin, but he used to regularly hang out with lower class people, the non-Brahmin, and actually actively supporting them. This was not seen in good light by his fellow Brahmins, but he did not care. He was also very much against superstition. He did not, he was a, he started his life as a priest, but he did not believe in idol worship. 
he did not believe in superstition. He was a very open-minded person. Now, Gopal Chandra, if you forget about the science he did, he was a literary genius. He wrote, he wrote, he wrote. He wrote not only about the work that he did on insects. He wrote about other things. He wrote about other people. He wrote. And uh, he wrote uh, in Prabashi, Bharat Borsho, Prakriti, Desh, Anundabaja, Jugantar. It was an on and on. He also aired regular programs from Akashbani. Now, he wrote in Bangla. And there was a man, Shottin Bosh, Shottendranath Bose, who was a champion of doing science in your mother tongue. He was a champion and they started the Bongyo Bigyan Purishad. Okay. Anyway, he, start, he, and so he started the Bongyo Bigyan Purishad. And an important part of the Bongyo Bigyan Purishad he was to come out with a monthly magazine in Bangla where science will be discussed, science, scientific temper will be encouraged. And who else but Gopal Chandra? So Gopal Chandra was invited by Shottendranath Bose and others to edit the magazine Gano Began. And he was started editing it uh, as a, a regular editor from March 1949. Remember, this is the time he's working on tadpoles. So he's actually a very active researcher. He was also an incredible editor. He not only edited uh, articles, he not, not only, and he had to write a large number of articles to make the magazine going. Okay. Uh, a very important part, I think, he did at this time, he started a section called Kore Dakho. Kore Dakho in English means. Uh, do it and learn. And in this section, in this magazine, he used to give details about hands-on experiments that children would do. He, because he all his life, he said, don't memorize. Don't study before doing it. Do it first. You know, wet your hands. Do it first. Do it even when you don't understand what you're doing. But do it. Then ask, why do I see? What do I see? And so I think it is so important that uh, for my own experience of working with children, doing science, even doing when I teach MSc classes here, uh, I always see uh, students have never done anything with their own hands. And until you do it yourself, you don't ask questions. You do not become a scientist. Uh, uh, I am getting close. I just want to show you this picture. One, uh, well, people who are seeing it, you can see this lawn in Bose Institute, old building. People who are only listening, I just want to say that if you go to Bose Institute, our old building and Raja Bajar, you have a beautiful lawn in the middle. And if you ever go there, I want you to remember this story. In this lawn, Gopal Chandra one day saw in the morning crow feathers being stuck on the ground just like flags. He wondered what is going on. In the evening, he saw a lot of crows shedding feathers. And next morning, these feathers would stand straight up on the ground as if somebody has posted them on like a, a flag. Gopal Chandra had to find out. He stayed all night. He could not see anything. Next night, he again stayed. Then in the evening around 8 o'clock, he saw these feathers started moving. He turned on his flashlight and he saw that there were some earthworms who were pulling the feathers into their holes. Because at the end of the feathers, there was some flesh that the earthworms wanted to eat. And so earthworms basically pulling the feathers, pushing them into their holes, and the feathers would stand up. There's a little writing in Bangla here for people who see this, but it does not matter. So what is the big deal? The big deal is that he saw something, he had to find out the answer. He had to document it especially if it had to do with the natural world. Now, Bose Institute, uh, the quadrangle is open. But during that time, there was a greenhouse. And Gopal Chandra used to make artificial, you know, uh, environments there to grow insects, to breed insects. There were incredible things used to happen then. Uh, I am very close to finishing. I just want to uh, tell you two things. One is there's a book called Poro Chorcha by a guy called Himanish Goswami. Himanish Goswami is a writer whose father, Porimal Goswami, was an editor writer who was a good friend of Gopal Chandra. 
in this porocharcha himanish goshami remembers a visit that he had with gopal chandra at bosun studio i just want to tell you about this visit visit so himanish goshami was young he and his friend went to meet gopal chandra gopal chandra was working with a microscope and uh, he uh, he gopal chandra talked to them about many different things then they told gopal chandra can we have some water gopal chandra said yes there is some water in that tumbler at that corner go and get a glass so they went and uh, had glass of water they washed the glass and they put it on the a uh, tumbler the tumbler was made with a uh, mud and so it was cold because there was evaporation so gopal chandra explained to them why water in a mud tumbler becomes cold then gopal chandra told them have you washed your glass very well they said yes he said bring the glass so they brought the glass they put some tiny pits uh, you know uh, drops of water on a slide put it on the microscope and they started seeing incredible microbes in the water and what himanish writes is this changed their life and gopal chandra started telling them how not all microbes are bad some microbes are good we need it remember this is the time he was talking about that vitamin b12 and 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 uh, the tadpoles this just shows that he how natural scientist he was he was he was a natural scientist uh, he got awards 1951 he was invited to conduct the indian delegation at the international union for the study of social insects in paris he could not go 1968 he got the anand puraskar for literature 1974 he was felicitated from bose institute same year he got the acharya satyendranath bose award 1975 rovindra puraskar 1979 he got the jubilee medal on the diamond jubilee celebration of bose institute but most importantly he died in 1981 just a year before couple of months before he died kolkata university gave him an honorary dsc degree i think that was the greatest thing uh, that uh, happened to him he finally <coughs> got recognized he actually tried to go to college uh, online uh, sorry online was not there uh, there were evidence but somehow it didn't mature i want to finish with uh, the last slide and i want to show a man called ratan lal brahmachari now ratan lal brahmachari is someone is very much like uh, gopal chandra except that he was uh, trained ratan lal brahmachari is an ethologist who is no more with us he did his phd in physics with satyendranath bose he worked in physics for 10 years then he said forget physics i want to do biology he moved to biology he joined indian statistical institute prashanto chandra mohan nobis was there and he did biology he is well known for his work on pheromones especially tigers when i was in college young man i had a chance to meet ratan lal brahmachari at the ais indian statistical institute it was very exciting for me to see his laboratory and every time i read i read about gopal chandra i think of ratan lal brahmachari ratan lal brahmachari was uh you know really he pushed for recognition of gopal chandra more than anybody else he really did it and in an interview he said that even though indian institute of science bangalore where ethology uh, school of ethology has uh, been the most prominent in india even the gopal chandra never was there but he always thought that gopal chandra's successors in india belong to that school i and then he then he mentioned people like raman sukumar i'm just mentioning his his names that he mentioned because if you are interested you should not just stop at uh, gopal chandra raman sukumar famous for working on elephants rene borges for famous for working on wasps raghavendra gadatkar more names can be mentioned i personally can name a few people who are famous for the work that gopal chandra started they are my acquaintances one is anindo sinha he works in bangalore shilanjan bhattacharya he works for west bengal state university and he also writes incredible accounts of insect stories in bangla and anindita bhadro who is at isar kolkata i think i'm done uh, uh, i of course uh, all information i mentioned here is i learned from someone else 
I did not generate this. Specifically, I would like to mention an article by Pradeep Parikh in Science and Culture, a book called Gopal Chandra Bhattacharya, uh, 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 published by Gopal Chandra Bhattacharya Bigan Prashar Somiti, and a book of Gopal Chandra, his biography by Ronotos Chakraborty by Bongyo Bigyan Purishad. Uh, thank you. I think uh, I made it in time. One hour. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, hey, no, sir. Go to that. Okay. Uh, go to that. Yes. Uh, that was really, really entertaining. And we have some uh, questions in our hand. So. Should I uh, uh, turn off my uh, uh, thing? Like okay. So? Whatever. Stop. I'm stopping my presentation. Yeah. Mm, okay. So shall I proceed uh, the questions? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So uh, there are two questions uh, by Prajwal. The first is that uh, is it too much uh, romanticizing of low cost science uh, harmful to the kind of science promoted in the country? Say once more. Uh, so, is it too much romanticizing of the low-cost science uh, harmful to the kind of science promoted in the country? Uh, oh, uh, if I understand the question, okay. My answer is no. Low-cost science is important. High-cost science is also important. I think both are very important. Remember, at the end of the day, science is a way of thinking. Science is not technology. Okay. Tomorrow, technology may disappear. You see... For example, today you can say that India is sending uh, a rocket to moon. That's great. You need money for it. But if Newton's second law of motion, which is force is equal to mass into acceleration, was not discovered, no matter how much money you had, you could not have gone to the moon with a rocket. So rocket and high cost science is important. Absolutely. Low cost science is important. But as a scientist, all I'm trying to say is that we have to think, we have to learn how to think. And it does not matter whether you learn with a high cost machine or a low cost machine. So it is not, nothing is at the cost of anything else. But in general, I would say in school, in high school, in junior high school, we should have more hands on experiments. And experiments may, should not have an answer. You see, when I, I, won, I did chemistry experiments, we were given salt, a white salt, and we were told to find out what is it, sodium chloride or calcium chloride or magnesium chloride or barium chloride. And often the tests would not work. If the test did not work, I would not get marks. So I would feed, give some money to the assistant and find out the answer and write the answer. So how science should happen is I should try to do the test. Even if I cannot find the answer, it does not matter. And, and, and so that I think that lacks here. I think young children are not allowed to interact with nature. They are not allowed to ask questions. Uh, all my life, people call me sir, 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 sir. Sir doesn't work. Because the moment you call me sir, you cannot question me. I'm in a hierarchy much higher. I have to be a friend. And uh, you know, at least when you're doing science, that's my uh, feeling. Okay, so there is another question uh, by Prajwal that by giving more exposure to just theoretical work or low cost experimental science, won't the community lag behind in often cutting edge experimental areas? I, I think I answered. I think I answered in the first part. It is not uh, mutually exclusive. I think both are important. Uh, okay, that's all I can say. We have another question. That what is the main thing missing in the recent Indian science that we are getting distant from the common people? Like we had this uh, Bongyo Bikan Purishad and many other associations before for the promotion of popular science. I think popular science was always promoted by individuals. By you see, if you ask me, the best way of doing science in India is by science clubs. So if you really want to uh, improve science in India, make a club, make a club, make a hobby, go out and hang out with people. We lack scientific temperament. We lack scientific, see science is not necessarily high tech stuff. We lack 
scientific temperament. The other thing that we lack, if you really ask me about Indian society, we are a very hierarchical society. You tell me how many of us, I come from a middle class family, if my, uh, you know, my, if, if my washing machine stops working, will I open my washing machine to see what is going on inside? No, because we come from a hierarchical society. Okay. So we are not used to, so for us, I went to IIT, I went to IIT Kanpur. Uh, and uh, I know a lot of people who have come out from IIT. You know, you can get a degree in automobile engineering, but if your car goes bad, wrong, you cannot fix it. An eight-year-old kid who never gone to school will go under your car and say, give me a little piece of soap, I'm going to fix it. So we are not used to doing things with our own hand. And I think that is extremely important. We are, not, we are afraid to ask questions. We should ask questions. More young people should become part of decision-making process. Too many old people take decisions in India. I want to see more young people participating in decisions. Okay. I'm not against old people. I think we need both old and young. Today, if you ask about science, 20 years later, I will be dead. Most of you will be alive. 20 years later, uh, global warming will be a reality. It will not be some imagination. So who should take decision about global warming? You or me? You, because you will face it. I will not face it. So young people must come in, must come in. Uh, I think uh, these are, I think, the, anyway, to answer the question, we should have more science clubs. Uh, it is not, the establishment is not going to do it. Uh, even uh, Bigyan Bongyo Polishad is was a science club. Uh, I mean, look at your radio. I mean, I love it that uh, students are doing this radio program. Thank I you. think more and more young people should take uh, take uh, take control and discuss. Yeah. Uh, we have another question: Is uh, how important is uh, blogging in science in today's time when information is much more easily accessible than in the times of Jizi uh, Bhattacharya? That's correct. So information is much more accessible. That's very important. And so uh, we just have a new national education policy. I have not had the chance to look at it very carefully. I hope our education policy should emphasize on not memorizing, but analyzing information. Getting information is very easy. Today, uh, the entire internet is, uh, you know, flooded with fake news. So we should learn how to differentiate between what is fake and what is not. So analyzing analysis of information is extremely important. And because yes, it is correct because there is so much information out there. So I think that is the only way. How do we deal with information? How do we analyze information? I think uh, these issues will become is becoming more and more important. Uh, here is a nice suggestion by uh, Snigtha actually, uh, it's towards you. So thanks Gautamda for the nice talk on uh, uh, Gopachandra Bhattacharya. It's my humble request to you, if possible, please take the initiative to translate Bangla to Potongu in English. You are the best known person in my mind who can do this. It will be a great help for all who want to do basic fundamental science and will be uh, a really really grateful i would request snigda to send me an email to me my name is uh, email is gotamda at gmail.com and snigda and i we can start talking okay it doesn't matter who does it uh, but it is important uh, to get it done absolutely so snigda please send me an email and we can start from there okay uh, there is another uh, comment from uh, professor aninda sina so oh, he's in the audience. Yeah, you better get him to better get him to give a talk. <laughs> we will definitely try to. Yeah. So what what is the comment? So there are great uh, comments about the talk. Just uh, putting one of them. A wonderful exposition of the fascinating achievements of a quietly pessimist individual. Thank you, Gautam. And you know who took me to meet Rathondal Brahmachari on in the Sina. Anindo and I, we were classmates, and he took me to meet Rathandal Brahmachari, and I'll never forget that meeting. You know, sometimes you meet someone and you never forget. It it really inspires you. Yeah. Rathandal Brahmachari died a couple of years ago. 
uh, but he was an incredible man. I mean, he did his PhD in physics, partic in, in, you know, in um, theoretical physics with Shotten Bosch. He worked in physics for 10 years. Then he did biology. That shows we can do anything if we really want to. Okay, so we are uh, finished with this today's session. Thank you, Bosonda, once again for this uh, amazing talk. And we are really, really enlightened. And No, no, I mean, thank you for pushing me to read and uh, put this talk together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So we will be back with uh, another session probably very soon from Campus Radio Aizar Kolkata. Good evening and goodbye.